Hello, everybody, and welcome to the latest DTS webinar entitled The Basics of Temperature Measurements. We really appreciate you joining us today. My name is Mike Beckage, and I'll be introducing our speaker in a moment. So, John, if you would please advance to the next slide. So this is a webinar format, and what that means is that uh, you'll be able to see our video and our presentation, but we won't have video and audio from the participants. If you would like to ask a question, make a comment, um, please use what's referred to as the Q&A box in Zoom. We have um, a couple of panelists who will be monitoring the content and we'll be doing our best to keep up with whatever questions come in. We are recording this webinar and this is actually the eighth webinar in the series that we put together since the pandemic lockdowns took place. And it will be located on our website under the DTS video library after the uh, webinar in a couple of days. So, you know, hopefully you can go back and take a look at it or share it with colleagues if uh, you found the information valuable. Next slide, John. For our webinar today, your host is John Moores. He's an application support engineer based in our California headquarters. You've also got me as the ho uh, as the moderator and a panelist, and Kate Martin, located in England, is a panelist as well. And so Kate and I will be trying to keep up with your questions uh, along the way in the chat boxes, and then at the end of the presentation, we'll also touch bases with any questions that we think might be valuable to the larger group. So with that, John, if you'd advance the slide, and introduce yourself. Good morning, everyone. And thank you for joining us today. We're happy to have all of you here. First and foremost, I'd like to introduce myself, particularly as I'm a new face here at DTS, working in their Seal Beach, California office. I've been working in biomechanics since 2011. So I'm actually coming up on 10 years here. Uh, I began working at the UVA Center for Applied Biomechanics where I designed test fixtures and was part of their destructive crash test teams. I got the opportunity to work there with both ATDs and cadavers in both instrumentation and post-test autopsies. When I came out here to California, I initially worked for BRT, supporting their litigation work with car crash simulations, again, full crash tests and uh, data acquisition. While at BRT, I also supported research at USC, the University of Southern California, primarily in their ballistics, body armor, and sports injury testing. Throughout my career, I've been using DTS software and hardware, so I'm very excited to be part of their team now as they support all of you running your tests out in the field. So today we're discussing temperature, and we'll start with the basic concepts of temperature itself. Now at first, that might seem a very simple topic, but there are some common misconceptions that we'll make sure we're clear on before proceeding. We will then discuss the primary factors for measuring temperature. And after that, we'll give just a sample of some of the applications in which our customers are applying these concepts. Finally, we'll give an overview of some of the key elements you need to have in mind when making your set of decisions and the corresponding DTS resources that we've built to help make sure you have full confidence in your results. So, what is temperature? While we might think we know what temperature is in our heads right off the cuff, it's not always an easy thing to clearly define in one sentence. And also, temperature is often confused with thermal energy, so we want to make sure that we move forward together with a clear operational definition. Once we're armed with that clarity, we can have a better understanding of the measurement process itself. So, as mentioned, temperature is not the equivalent of the thermal energy of a system. For example, a burning match has a much higher temperature than an iceberg. 
but the total heat energy within an iceberg greatly exceeds the match. This is because temperature is an intrinsic value or a value that does not depend on the quantity of matter. A second and maybe more fun example, pizza. We know that if you place cold pizza onto aluminum foil, put both in the oven and heat it for 20 minutes, you can reach in and touch the foil. And while the foil has a high temperature, its low mass means it also has low thermal energy and you're not burned. Just don't touch that pizza. So now we can move forward knowing the difference between temperature and thermal energy. So what is temperature? Well, we can think of it in two basic concepts. One, temperature gives an understanding of molecular motion, measuring the average kinetic energy of the particles in an object. As temperature of that object rises, so does the average speed of its particles. It can also give an understanding of the difference between two objects in terms of in which direction heat will flow. We know that temperature is, therefore, a helpful data point as it also implies how the object might affect the materials immediately surrounding it, particularly those in direct contact. In thinking of that motion and the concept of sharing, absolute zero relates the point at which the object has no spare energy to give to other objects, which is measured as zero degrees Kelvin. Motion itself does not necessarily completely cease, but the sharing element does. So with this in hand, it makes sense that temperature isn't simply a measure of hotness, although that is an accurate description, but a variable data point that can be incredibly useful in a variety of applications. Temperature scales are essentially arbitrary in that they are measuring the same thing. Absolute zero is more a reflection of what we just reviewed, but the numbers differ only with the scale you're using. So Kelvin uses absolute zero at its starting point. So it keeps it simple and calls it zero Kelvin. Celsius uses rounded numbers for a more common and universal standard like water freezes at zero degrees and boils at 100 degrees. As for Fahrenheit here in the United States, we just prefer to keep our numbers as interesting as possible. Now I've placed a conversion table here as that's a common tool. And again, this webinar is being recorded so you can always refer back to it. One of the most important things to remember here is that you can configure a readout device to display in any of these units. You just need to know first what scale you are going to use. So how do we measure it? We know that certain material properties change with temperature and some materials have a linear relationship with temperature, at least for certain ranges, which makes them a good ally for getting helpful readings. The most universally known, of course, is the traditional thermometer. It simply contains a fluid in a tube, and that tube has been designed to allow the rising or falling level of the liquid to match the corresponding temperature. Other materials have changes that can be useful with an electronic system. Resistance or voltage may change within an element, and that can be placed into a measuring system. And if we set it up correctly, we can get accurate readings. There are some common options for the solution, and that is what we will cover next. But first, we also like to take advantage of these webinars as a way to gauge what's most useful to you going forward. So in that spirit, I am going to be opening a poll that you should see first on your screen. Just need to navigate it. Am I bearing with me? Okay. So, you should be able to see that on your screen now. And there are three main questions that should be visible to you. What temperature sensors are you currently using? What is your primary industry? And how confident are you setting up your current sensors, hardware, and software? So we'll give this about a, uh, about a minute to make sure uh, folks can have time to 
submit. And then we'll, uh, we'll end the poll. I'll review the options a little bit as they're coming in and then we'll proceed. As of right now, we're not seeing too many surprises on the sensor end. Thermocouples have a very strong, healthy lead. Looks like uh, aerospace is a little bit ahead in the primary industry. And in terms of confidence for setting up current sensors, we're right, right in the middle, medium confidence. Good to know. Got some high confidence in there too. Thanks for, thanks for being here and making sure you dot your I's and cross your T's. Give this just a little bit more and then uh, we'll end it there. Okay. Just a little more time. Got it. A few more seconds. Yeah, thermocouples are in first. RTDs coming up second though, so that's good. We'll be covering them as well today, so that's good to see. Automotive just made it past aerospace in the last second. All right, so aerospace and automotive are, automotive are right there with each other. Otherwise, we are at medium confidence for setting up sensors. Wonderful. All right, well, I'm gonna end the poll now and then move forward with the um, PowerPoint. But I'm first gonna show these results. It'll show in orange who the current winner is, although you can see, particularly in industry, it was a a little bit of a closer race, but no surprise with thermocouples. Those are a very, very common instrument out in the field. Um, but uh, RTDs are, are there as well, a healthy competitor. And some of you are here more for educational purposes, not using any current sensors, good to know. Automotive, like I said, just a little bit past aerospace. Medium confidence being first and about a quarter of us having high confidence, okay. Thanks for doing that. That gives us some good, good information um, moving forward in general, as well as in this PowerPoint. But that's good info. Thank you for doing that. So moving forward, we'll start with one of the uh, strong candidates on that list, RTDs. So resistance temperature detectors are one such method such method for measuring temperature. And these measure the change in resistance as the temperature changes. So the overall resistance of the system is what changes and can be modified. An RTD, therefore, uses a resistor as its main function. Platinum is a common material here. And as the element itself can be fragile, it's typically protected by an outer layer. Much like this. As mentioned, Platinum is particularly useful as a material, so the PT100, P standing for platinum, is a very common model. The name simply means, by PT100, it will deliver a 100 ohms resistance at zero degrees Celsius. So, some of the main points to keep in mind when it comes to RTDs. They give some great advantages when selected and set up correctly, like stability, accuracy and repeatability, but they're not best known for having the widest range of temperature readings. But never fear, we have another option coming up that can give us that flexibility if needed. And it looks like our polls gave us a little bit of a spoiler. Given how RTDs function, some customization and additional wiring may be needed, and we have some resources on that as well. The great thing about all of the measuring solutions we're discussing is that we make things simple. This is actually a trick question. As for all of these measuring solutions, the answer is yes. What comes next is simply making sure that your software, also something DTS can supply, is set up correctly. But we'll cover a little bit more of that later. So next, the reigning champion from our polls, thermocouples. How do these work? Well, these measure the change in voltage as the temperature changes, and therefore are another com common simple solution. You can either connect them directly to your DAS here, or you can use an adapter. So how does it work? Well, simply put, two wires of differing material are joined at one end. This is called a junction, or a hot junction here is this is where the temperature itself is measured. 
Cold junction is another topic entirely. As this is heated, it creates a continuous current and the resulting voltage can be read as a temperature. So how does DTS support this solution? Well, like all these sensors, connecting to your DTS DAS is simple. We sell a thermocouple adapter which supports the type K thermo thermocouple. Type Ks uh, have a very wide linear operational range. And for that reason, they are one of the most popular options out there. And to give you a look here, I'll hold this up to the camera. I know my, my, my screen is a little smaller for you, but this is that exact product. So you can see it's a pretty simple device. It shows your, uh, if you can read it, shows the type K display. Um, and this is what you pl uh, plug your thermocouple probe into. So you simply line up your, uh, my lighting's a little tough, but your positive and negative, plug them in, and then you're able to directly connect this into your DTS DAS. One of the great things about this option is it gives you cold junction compensation. And like I said, makes it really easy to plug directly into your data acquisition system. Now our adapter, as you can see on the sheet here, supports two sensor ranges, 100 to 400 degrees Celsius and zero to 1250. We found those to be particularly uh, common ranges. Like I said, plug-in is easy. And we have a few pictures here of connecting to a uh, DTS DAS. You can see we have some of our slice systems there on the, on the left side. And there's the, there's the adapter I showed you earlier. And Pretty simple solution, only a couple steps. So thermocouples come in multiple options depending on your specific needs, varying in application. So in this case, we have some that are more for extreme temperatures here. Uh, we got these shots from uh, omega.com. You also have options for mounting. You could paste on, or in this case, it's a cement on solution. So that's one of their other thermocouples you can get. And for wiring, you can customize it yourself or get assistance from us. These guys actually come with a retractable cable. So a lot of options out there for the probe itself. The only step you need to take next is plugging it into your system. One of the great advantages of thermocouples is the wide range of classifications based on the temperature range that they can accurately cover. So if you go to a manufacturer site like Omega that makes, makes those probes among many other things, they will actually break down the types of thermocouples and the corresponding ranges. Excuse me. So you can see in this table here, I've just made it simple and showed you the, some of the common types, K being one of them, but J, E, and T are also displayed. And the full table on Omega will give you even more details as to what you can expect. Some of the main points to keep in mind with thermocouples. As mentioned, they have a good range for different temperatures. The cold junction effect that results from material contacts, again, we're not gonna get into that much here, can be easily accounted for with adapters. It may be necessary to have linearity compensation, and it's possible that you'll need special connectors um, like these, I've got some diagrams here that we've pulled from one of the articles that we'll refer to a little bit later. Our final candidate for today, and we saw that this one did get some votes on the poll, so some folks using these, are semiconductors. These two measure a change in voltage. They just do it a little different by using a diode. They have their own benefits to consider, of course. They have pretty high accuracy and a low power draw. But one such benefit is a bit unique in that they have a high output. And that, of course, needs to be considered for um, when judging your amplification and sensitivity required. Their range is not nearly as wide as thermocouples, and you need to be aware that they may need specific packaging. But as for connecting to DTS DAS, we already know the answer. Yes. And here is such a probe. This is a semiconductor. You can see this one is very small, very good for small spaces. Um, pretty simple cabling here, pretty much as simple as it gets. And then it outputs to a connector that again can go to one of our systems. So keep things simple. The semiconductor, while it's 
may not be quite in the top rung with those thermocouples there. Another, another great solution. So to review all the solutions we've covered, broken down here some of the benefits and considerations for each option in this table. We'll see about taking resources like these and uploading them as well. And this is being recorded too, so you can always refer back. But as you can see, RTDs can give highly accurate noise resistant readings, but possibly at a higher price. Thermocouples have perhaps the most flexibility as they come in several different types, but not without additional requirements for accuracy. The thermocouple probe itself is generally pretty cheap, but the adapter could add a little bit of cost to the overall solution. Semiconductors land somewhere in the middle with more of a narrow temperature range, but similar benefits to the RTD and perhaps with a lower cost. So if you use thermocouples pretty uh, often, not a bad idea to see if RTDs or semiconductors could fill in some of the gaps for you. Next, I'm just gonna give some basic examples of some of the applications in which our clients have employed temperature sensors. One of our clients measured the actual exhaust from a rocket as it took off. In this case, a sensor that is properly mounted and configured can give really useful data for an application like this, particularly when the data acquisition system itself might need to be mounted away from an otherwise unsafe heat source. Uh, some, some folks may use this, uh, particularly in a fighter jet or military payload scenario uh, where they definitely want to measure what's occurring, but they may want the, the DAS itself to be closer to the pilot or the cockpit or some other telemetry source, depending on, depending on what works for you. Another very common application is monitoring events for longer transport. Obviously, making sure your items being shipped are safe is pretty important, and temperature can coincide with any other notable events that the other sensors in the test setup detect. Finally, in sort of a broad stroke of where uh, such sensors can spend a lot of their time is as the primary data of interest or as a secondary safety or monitoring method while either building or testing out your own equipment in-house. There's an immense breadth of applications. Uh, these things are used all over the place, which is why we wanna make sure we walk through the benefits and applications as thoroughly as we can. Finally, we're gonna cover what we recommend that you have in mind when selecting and setting up your sensors, as well as what comprehensive materials we have listed, listed up in our help center. So when setting things up on your software, we make this pretty simple uh, with whatever software package you're using from us. There are uh, type ins or drop downs that can make sure you're following things accordingly. And when you're doing this, Make sure you pay attention to your sensor type. That will depend on the sensor, but it's one to definitely keep your eye on. A little more obvious, sensitivity. You'll probably get this from your cow sheet. And you'll wanna know your desired range as well as your zeroing method. And here again, this will depend a lot on the sensor you're using. Uh, everything from that point forward can be pretty specific, but we wanna make sure that we're up front with the first four that you want to really have your eye on when setting things up correctly. So for the little more specifics here, if we're talking about an RTD, what is the general process for making sure you've got it set up? Well, first, make sure you've selected the proper RTD for your application. As mentioned, you may need some additional wiring considerations, particularly with regards to uh, your resistance. And then course, choose your preferred scale. Regardless of your setup or your initial confidence, it's always good to do an empirical check and just about everybody can get their hands on some ice. So not a bad idea to make sure it's reading as it should at around freezing. Here are the key settings you'll need to set. So if you're going into your software, you want to make sure that you're checking all of these accordingly. For making sure that you have your setup done correctly, our help center has an article that includes an actual Excel sheet where you can type in all the important points of your setup so you have confidence that you're doing it correctly. We'll mention a little later how to do that, but 
we give you options like this to, to make sure we're checking all the boxes as we go through. Following the same process, but now for a thermocouple, which may or may not require an adapter. First, find out if you do need one, one being that adapter, and make sure you have the appropriate one for your type, and make sure you have the specific thermocouple for your application. As always, make sure you know the scale and how you would like that to uh, read out in your display. While you can, of course, get your ice bath ready, there's nothing wrong with that, there are also thermocouple simulators on the market that can help you run your empirical checks. So the one pictured here actually lets you toggle the thermocouple type, like type K or J, whichever you're using, and then use that little round dial to uh, dial the multiple readings to make sure your setup is correct. Over the range of interest, you could dial it to several data points and make sure it's performing as needed. Again, key settings are here. This would be specific for setting up your thermocouple. And as, bef as before, we have an article that will break things down a little bit more for you and give some really, really good specifics. Uh, this specific one also has uh, SIFs, so you can download them, uh, your sensor uh, information file types, or use them for whatever form um, works best for you, and they can be sort of a skeleton structure. Um, but you can download them and use them directly. While these methods are not limited to DTS products, we have a, a wide range of items with which you can apply these simple techniques for confidence in your results. You can see a lot of them here. Our range is displayed on this slide, and we're happy to discuss any of these options as a new setup or supplement to whatever test configuration you already have. Speaking of the Help Center, which has been noted a couple times in this presentation, I'm going to go through some of the quick steps for getting the information that you need. First, keeping it simple, how do you get there? On our main website, you can click the Contact DTS dropdown on the top right. So right here. If you then click Help Center, you'll be on your way. You should then see this landing page here, which gives you a, a full layout of all the resources that are available to you. You can see on this screen, we have a variety of documents, software downloads, data sheets, and drawings. So there's a wide variety of support materials here. It's just a matter of opening them up. We are constantly adding content to this site with walkthroughs, informationals, and diagrams to make sure that you have confidence in your test setup. Now this content, it's inspired both by what we've learned that really helps folks out in the field, and also by direct requests by customers like yourself. If there's a consistent question or a thing that's come up in, in any other aspect of our dialogues, let us know. We're always happy to print something up that can be used for, for yourself and other people that might have the same question. For all of those reasons, this is why we highly recommend the Help Center as your first stop for support. As an example of that search button, if you type thermocouple, you'll see we have a few resources here to assist. So you can see the results here. You have a data sheet for that slice thermocouple adapter. You know, and I showed you that a little bit earlier. Then next is that sensor setup. And that's the one I refer to later that walks you through making sure you've, you've applied all the correct software settings and understand uh, why the wiring is done the way it is uh, that comprehensive article is, is with that link there. Uh, we've got one on grounding and isolation considerations, and then another on direct soldering of your um, thermocouple to your DAS, in this case for our new Slice 6 Air product. So quite a few things here for thermocouples, and that's no surprise given their overall popularity and the, uh, the crowning achievement in that poll. But likewise, you can type in RTDs, and it'll bring you to that that setup document I mentioned earlier, the one that explains a lot of the setup that you need to have in mind, as well as the accuracy, uh, and has linked to it that Excel sheet that will give you a much more robust uh, system of putting in the details that you need. Now, if you can't find what you need from the content that's already available, or you need assistance with your testing, Right down here in the bottom right, you can ask for direct support from our team. 
we are always happy to help. Down here, you can either register as a new user, if you haven't done that already, which allows you to then submit a request for a help ticket or simply submit otherwise. But we do recommend registering. Now, once that request has been submitted, we have support engineers in multiple time zones and various backgrounds who can assist. We have currently 26 agents, and typically we're able to respond to your request in less than eight hours. Registering, again, that, that creates a profile for your setup, and it keeps your records, requests, and coworkers all organized together going forward. You can also submit a help ticket regardless, but registering keeps all of your info in one place. So at this point, I'm gonna check back in with our panelists. Mike, would you mind walking us through the questions we've been receiving so far? Well, John, first of all, I wanna thank you for an, a well-presented expose on measuring temperature, uh, specifically with its, uh, the different options and use of DTS equipment to do that. We had a couple of questions come in and they were mostly related to where to find setup information or helpful guidance. And uh, the basic answer is use our help center, please. Uh, although we are known for our measurements systems used in crash testing, um, military applications, flight tests, and so on, we have a lot of other resources on the help center to help you do things that um, you may not you may not have uh, thought you'd find on the help center. So our first advice is always go to our help center and use the search function with a keyword. Uh, that, that was really the gist of the questions that came in. But uh, again, John, I wanna thank you for a well-presented uh, instructional uh, setup here on how to go through all the different types of ways to measure temperature with DTS equipment. Um, we have support staff in seven time zones around the world, and, and we're always available to either chat by email on the Help Center or uh, by phone or uh, other video conference. So my advice is if you have an application that we haven't covered, or and that can be anything in the realm of measuring temperature or beyond, uh, please use our help center and contact us. We love questions and we love to help people by giving applications support. I'll just throw out an example. We have some aerospace customers who use heat transfer gauges and we have an article on the help center that talks about how do you set up and use a heat transfer gauge that might be useful in hypersonics or various types of high velocity flight testing. You may not think that you'd find that on the Help Center, but we have it. I want to thank you, our audience, for being here. As we mentioned in the outset of the presentation, this is being recorded and will be available for later, um, for you to watch it later in the DTS video library. And don't hesitate to contact us if you have questions. So thanks again for being here. We really appreciate you and your interest in DTS. With that, I think we're going to leave the panelists, uh, leave, leave the Q&A open for another minute or two in case you have a question and we'll try to get those answered. Looks like, uh, John, you, you did such a great job in the presentation. There are no new questions, so I'll hand it back to you to give your final thoughts. Okay, very good. Well, with that, I want to thank uh, each and every one of you for attending. We uh, really appreciate you taking the time uh, out of your schedule to attend all of these webinars. Uh, and your feedback and questions greatly assist us in making sure that we have the kind of support and service needed to be a part of your testing. For my part, I also want to thank Mike Beckage for moderating and Kate Martin, along with Mike, for holding their posts as panelists throughout the webinar. Um, Thanks again, all of you for being here and uh, it'll be available for you to see if you missed it this time. And um, thanks again, we really appreciate it. Hope you have a great rest of your day or evening.